Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the April 2023 edition of the Southeast Monthly Climate Webinar, where we talk about the climate and special topics pertaining to the Southeast region. My name is Chris Furman. I'm the regional climatologist with NOAA's Southeast Regional Climate Center, and I'll be giving a climate overview of the past month. Our other speakers today are Jeff Dober from the Southeast River Forecast Center, who will provide a water resources update, Pam Knox from the University of Georgia, who will provide an agricultural impacts update, and joining us today, we're pleased to have Adam Tarando from the USGS Climate, uh, sorry, uh, USGS Southeast Climate Adaptation and Science Center, uh, who will be discussing how a warming planet may affect precipitation in the Southeast US. So again, thank you all for joining us this morning. Just a reminder to type your questions and comments into the question box at any time, and they'll be answered at the end. Also, a recap email of this webinar will be sent out with a YouTube link to the recording in a few days. All right, let's get started with an overview of the climate. So this uh, sounds like a broken record, but over the past month, we've seen a continuation of above average temperatures across the region. Uh, in fact, the map on the left probably looks very similar to the one we looked at last time, uh, with mean temperatures running about two to four degrees above average across much of the Southeast. Uh, however, if we look across the Northern and Southern ends of the region, we see temperatures running between four and six degrees above average, and even uh, a few spots running a bit higher than that. Uh, in the middle and Western parts of the region, we see some locations running a bit closer to average, and that's probably connected to increased clouds and precipitation that we'll look at here in a second. Uh, looking in the Caribbean there on the right, we see that temperatures were pretty close to average across much of Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Uh, San Juan was running a bit below average, while some locations along the southern slopes were running a bit above average uh, over the past month. Okay, next slide. So with all these warm temperatures, let's revisit the year-to-date rankings and see where we stand through the first quarter or so of the year. Uh, the image on the left is from the March State of the Climate Report from NCEI, and it shows that every state in the Southeast, except for Alabama, observed their warmest January through March on record since 1895. Uh, Alabama's first quarter temperature ranked second, so not, not that far behind. Uh, if we extend the station level rankings through the first three weeks of April, we see on the right that many locations across Florida and the Northern Gulf Coast, as well as parts of the Carolinas and Virginia, uh, have observed or have uh, continued to uh, observe their warmest start to the year, uh, with most other locations observing one of their top three warmest starts uh, to the year. Okay, next slide. So looking at precipitation over the past month, I mentioned that the more seasonal temperatures across the middle of the region may be tied to a cloudy and wet pattern uh, with a few frontal passages. And indeed, we see that in the precipitation uh, anomaly map there on the left, where uh, rainfall across central portions of uh, Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina was several inches above uh, average in places. We also see above average rainfall across South Florida, especially in Broward County, where significant flooding occurred around the middle of the month. Uh, in fact, the rainfall amounts from that event are probably having a profound effect on the scale uh, on the map here, uh, which is probably washing out some of the detail across other uh, parts of the region. Um, anyway, looking elsewhere, we see generally below average precipitation across much of Virginia and Western North Carolina, as well as parts of Southern Georgia, South Carolina, and much of Florida. Uh, on the right, we see that dry conditions continue to persist across the Caribbean, except for a few locations in the uh, Eastern interior of uh, Puerto Rico. Okay, next slide. Uh, if we look at the year-to-date uh, precipitation rankings, we see that the southeast is uh, bookended with dry conditions to the north and south and a few wet locations in between. Uh, several locations across northern and eastern Virginia and the southern peninsula of Florida have observed their driest or one of their driest starts to the year. Uh, I should also mention that St. Croix in the Virgin Islands uh, observed its fifth driest start to the year over the uh, period shown here. Uh, in contrast, if we look at extreme southeast Florida, we see that this area has been uh, exceptionally wet due to several major rainfall events, the most notable occurring in the Fort Lauderdale area on April the 12th, uh, which we'll go ahead and look at on the next slide. Okay, so on the left, we see a radar animation showing where the precipitation occurred over about a 12-hour period beginning near midday on April the 12th. Uh, the blue circle there is the Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport, uh, with a running total of rainfall over this period recorded by a weather stem rain gauge located on the airport grounds. Uh, as we get about halfway through the animation, we see in the upper right there of the figure two rather large spikes in rainfall that were uh, associated with a supercell thunderstorm that sat over the airport uh, for several hours. 
uh, you'll see at the end a storm total amount of 25.95 inches, which if verified would set a new state record for 24 hour rainfall. As you can see from the uh, animation, most of this rainfall fell over a six to eight hour period, uh, which yields a return interval of one every thousand years or an annual probability of just 0.1%. Uh, the impacts from this event were uh, significant. Perhaps the most noteworthy was the flooding of the airfield at the Fort Lauderdale uh, Airport, as shown in the figure on the right. Uh, hundreds of flights were canceled and thousands of passengers unfortun uh, unfortunately were grounded for nearly three days while the floodwaters receded. Okay, next slide. All right, so shifting gears from flooding to drought. Uh, over the past month, we saw improvements in the drought monitor across parts of southern Alabama, southwest Georgia, and northwest Florida, as well as uh, eastern sections of the Carolinas. Uh, however, we saw an emergence of moderate drought and expansion of dry conditions across northern Virginia. Uh, down in Florida, we saw an expansion of severe drought across a large portion of the peninsula and an emergence of extreme or D3 drought, which was initially uh, introduced in Lee County uh, a few weeks ago, uh, now across the southern end of the Nature and Big Bend Coast, just north of Tampa Bay. Uh, several weather stations in this area have seen rainfall deficits of six to eight inches since the beginning of the year, which uh, in most cases is less than 25% of normal. Okay, next slide. Uh, looking in the Caribbean, we see that dry conditions have been mostly erased across eastern Puerto Rico and the outlying islands, uh, while, moderate, while moderate drought has expanded across much of the western end of the island. Uh, in fact, some uh, indicators have been pointing towards a uh, introduction of severe drought in this area. Uh, conditions remain dry across the Virgin Islands, particularly on St. Croix, uh, where the airport there has received less than half its normal rainfall uh, over the past two months. Okay, next slide. So some big changes in the ENSO forecast since last time. You may recall on the March webinar that the CPC forecast called for a chance of El Nino to form later this year, but confidence at that time was low. Uh, well, since that time, the CPC has issued an El Nino watch, meaning El Nino conditions are favored within the next six months. Uh, however, what's most notable is the over 60% chance of El Nino uh, by the May through July period and an over 80% chance by the middle of the fall. Uh, if we look at the model breakdown on the right, we now see more of a consensus between the average of the dynamical and statistical models, with the dynamical model suggesting the possibility of a strong El Nino by the end of the year. Uh, according to the CPC, some key precursors to El Nino development are already being observed in the tropical Pacific, uh, including a decrease in the strength of the trade winds and an increase in uh, oceanic heat content that is expected uh, to make it to the surface over the summer. Uh, these and uh, other factors have led to increased confidence in the El Nino forecast over the coming months. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, speaking of forecasts, uh, Colorado State University released its initial forecast for the upcoming Atlantic hurricane season back on April the 13th. Uh, their forecast is for slightly below average activity due largely to the expectation of El Nino conditions. Uh, however, they also note larger than normal uncertainty in the forecast uh, due to the uh, uncertainty in the strength of the developing El Nino, coupled with much warmer than normal sea surface temperatures in the eastern and central Atlantic basin. Okay, next slide. All right, so looking out over the next three months, we see that the CPC is forecasting a warm and uh, wet summer for the region. Uh, next slide. And this is reflected in the seasonal drought outlook, where drought removal is likely across uh, the entire region, including uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, next slide. Uh, now, in the short term, we are expecting below average temperatures across much of the region over the next few weeks, um, and uh, above average uh, precipitation is expected across northern Virginia and much of Florida through the middle part of next week. Okay, next slide. And we can see that in more detail here with the seven-day QPF. Uh, this is actually from yesterday, although it hasn't changed too much uh, since, uh, since then, uh, and it shows a pretty active uh, weather pattern for the region. Uh, with as much as uh, an inch uh, and a half to two inches of rain across a good portion of Florida and perhaps as much as three inches across parts of Virginia. Okay, next slide. Uh, looking out to two weeks, we see a continuation of below average temperatures across most of the region, uh, except in South Florida, and a continuation of above average precipitation across the southern tier of the region, with some interior portions leaning below average. Okay, next slide. 
And if we look out uh, three to four weeks, we see warm weather uh, persisting uh, across the Florida Peninsula, uh, with a good portion of the region once again leaning above normal with respect to precipitation. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, so thank you very much uh, for your attention. Here's a summary uh, for you to look over after the webinar. Also happy to answer any questions at the end. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff. All righty, thank you, Chris. And we'll start here. We're going to start talking about the early summer uh, stream flow and flood outlook. So as Chris said, we've been warm and wet uh, for most of the uh, latter half of the primary recharge period in the southeast. And we see how that's affected stream flows across the uh, southeast. A lot of green dots there for the most part. So mostly near normal stream flow conditions as far as the 28-day average. And if you look to the right there, the graph on the right, you can see uh, again, on average, we've been, uh, well, currently we're in the near, in the normal range there uh, in the green color. And uh, just to point out, you can see really going back through 2022, uh, a good part of the 28 days average stream flows have been in the normal range. Uh, a, a fairly big difference from what we've had in earlier years with the big wet and dry swings. Going to the next uh, slide, and you can see we break it down state by state, and we see the same single, Alabama, pretty much the, you see that black line, that's the 28-day average stream flows for the state, pretty much in the green range there, the normal range, going all the way back to 2022. We see it again for Georgia, maybe some short periods of, uh, remember back in the fall, we had a short period of dry weather and uh, early summer of 2022, but for the most part in the green range. And then Florida, as Chris pointed out, we've been a little bit drier and uh, that falls in line with the drought development down there uh, across central and southern Florida, uh, a little bit drier there in Florida. Going to the next slide. And now we're moving east into the Carolinas, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. For the most part, uh, uh, mostly all the same signal, mostly near normal. Uh, we did have a little bit of a dry part of the uh, February and March period, but we've come out of that and uh, we're near normal, with the exception of Virginia, some parts of Virginia, as far as stream flow. Go to the next slide and we can see here's the current conditions. Again, we're coming out of that primary recharge period. This is typically a, a time when stream flows start to fall off as pointed out in the previous graphs. And uh, so we're, we've got some residual high water making its way down through some of the larger coastal rivers there in Southern Georgia uh, and parts of the Carolinas, but the, for the most part quiet. And that's not, that's pretty typical this time of year. If we go to the next slide, we'll show you the flood climatology. And we can see we're in week 17. So we're coming out of our primary flood season which is usually February and March, and we're heading into sort of a lull period for stream flows and for river flooding. We're in week 17, but by uh, mid-May, uh, all the way into the early half, half of summer, it's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty quiet period for stream flows as temperatures warm up and rainfall becomes less organized. Uh, the only exception to this is if we go to the next slide, of course, the southeast is the Florida Peninsula. Um, they're, uh, they're sort of two stories with the southeast. We have the interior southeast, and then we have the Florida Peninsula. We're in week 17, usually a, a, a dry period. Uh, we don't see a lot of flooding this time of year in central and south Florida, but we will ramp up as we go into June and July as they get into a wet season. And uh, for us, we start to see flooding pick up uh, in the late summer, really in midsummer to uh, late summer and early fall as we go into the deeper into the tropical season. So uh, that's what we typically uh, have. Let's go to the next slide and I'll show you what we're looking toward. And we're gonna continue that trend of uh, really near normal risk of flooding. We're gonna probably see near normal stream flows. Again, as Chris pointed out, we do look a little wetter through the summer, but we're also warmer. Uh, and so those two things may even themselves out. The other factor is uh, there's quite a bit of uncertainty overall in the precip forecast typically for this early 
early summer period. So again, uh, river stream flows are mostly in the uh, normal range now. We'll see that continue. Uh, and uh, the uh, really the early summer flood threat is going to be uh, near normal, which typically is lower. Uh, and there's not much of a river flood threat. Really, our next river threat, flood threat in the southeast is as we go into the wet season in June and July in central Florida. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. And, and here's the summary slide again. Uh, stream flows near normal. We're expecting stream flows to be normal and, to th and through the early summer. Uh, We'll see how that goes into late summer and in the tropical season, as Chris pointed out with the uh, El Nino becoming more prominent. Uh, the caveat again is the Florida Peninsula. We'll see rain ramp up in June and July across central Florida, which could cause some flooding um, down there as well. So that's all I had as far as stream flows related to climate. Just a reminder, as far as the uh, rivers go, here at the, uh, as far as the southeast, uh, the Southeast River Forecast Center covers most of the southeast. But if you're in Tennessee uh, on, and on the call, you may actually, your rivers might be in the Lower Mississippi uh, River Forecast Center or the Ohio River Forecast Center. Um, and then if you're in parts of Virginia, Northern Virginia, the James River uh, or North, uh, your river forecast center is the uh, Mid-Atlantic River Forecast Center. And if you go to their websites, you can find more information on their rivers and their river forecasts. That's all I had as far as stream flows, and I will pass it off to Pam Knox. All right, well, good morning, everybody. If you follow memes on social media, you know that today is the perfect spring day. Um, just all you need is a light coat. That's certainly true in Athens today. So let's just jump right in, talk about agricultural impacts. Um, we're pretty much out of the frost season, as you might expect, but for the listeners who are in the mountains of the Northeast Georgia um, or Alabama, or of course the Carolinas and up on into Virginia, there has still been some frost and they've had some issues with that. Uh, they're not quite out of the woods yet because they're farther to the north, but I probably am not gonna talk any more about frost until we get close to fall again. So you could follow that along on the uh, perspectives tool on the Southeast Regional Climate Center's website. If we go on, some of the impacts of recent conditions on agriculture, they're still really trying to figure out the losses to peaches and blueberries, especially peaches from the March frost. We had, remember, two different uh, frost events in March. And some of those take a while to really show up in the trees, especially not so much blueberries, but um, estimates for some of the early peach varieties, uh, depending on where you are, have been around 70% loss or greater. The early varieties or the late varieties did better because they were not as far along in their development. Um, very dependent on local conditions as well. As you know, every field usually has frost pockets in areas where they're slightly warmer. In general, the commercial blueberries, a lot of those grow in southeast Georgia and along coastal areas where it's a nice sandy soil. They generally had fewer losses because they had temperatures that didn't get quite as cold for as long. And they also use frost protection irrigation. But some fields did have some losses. Um, probably not gonna see a huge dent in production of blueberries this year. You may see some reduction in peaches. The wet and cool cool soils that we've had have de delayed planting of peanuts and cotton, which usually need a soil temperature that's, you know, 65 degrees or more. Um, and so the cooler temperatures have not really helped with that. The wet conditions have made it a little hard to get uh, plants, uh, well, the machinery to plant the, the new seeds into the ground without causing compaction problems. And so that slowed people down a little bit as far as planting goes. One thing that's not on the slide here, but I noticed this morning is that it's also been slowing down the harvest of Vidalia onions, which is a big crop here in Georgia. Um, the wet conditions are just not good for the onions. They want it nice and dry to get the onions out and to not really see much uh, fungus. Fortunately, as Chris pointed out with his forecast, we're expecting quite a bit more rain the next few weeks, so we're not gonna see a, a big change in that anytime soon. Uh, producers are gonna wanna watch the forecast carefully to make sure that when they do get a window of good weather, they're out there 
and you know, and I'm speaking to the choir. I'm sure that they're all they all know that as well. Because of the wet conditions, the fungal diseases continue to be a problem in strawberries, um, watermelon down in Florida, and also some small grains like wheat. I've seen some, a number of pictures of fusarium um, on wheat, and so that's something that really comes into into play when we have these moisture conditions. And I just wanted to mention that I drove down to Sebring, Florida this weekend to a family reunion and noticed as we were driving up the center part of the Florida Peninsula that there's a lot of abandoned citrus orchards there. And I, I suspect, maybe David Zierden can address this later, um, some of those probably happened because of Hurricane Ian. I didn't see a lot of tree damage, but it's pretty flat there. And so um, I think if we'd been along the coast, we would have seen a lot more, but uh, it's definitely something that was noticed as we were driving along uh, the region. If we go on, uh, soil temperature and moisture, generally uh, soil temperatures in the southern part along the coastal plains have been above normal. That probably is related to some of the dry conditions we've had. Soil temperatures in uh, northern Alabama, northern Georgia, um, and to a lesser extent the Carolinas, the western Carolinas, have been below normal, which has delayed some corn planting a little bit uh, there, um, generally have been okay. Soil moisture, this is the 20 centimeter, so that's near the surface, has been relatively dry. Uh, moisture conditions farther down, but um, not anything that's really um, leaning one way or the other. If we go on, as Chris mentioned, the El Nino is coming on strong. Some changes since the last one. That it's something that I think producers are going to have to keep in mind for harvest. Um, if you look at the likelihood of different categories of El Nino, there's a 4 in 10 chance we'll see a strong El, El Nino and almost a 7 out of 10 chance of a moderate El Nino, which means that um, the conditions are likely to be uh, stronger than usual and maybe come on a little bit earlier. There's only a 10% chance of no El Nino. Got to keep, keep in mind it's spring. The forecasts are not usually as good, but they're still um, they're so consistent from one model to the next that I don't, I don't think it's going to be long before we see El Nino. If the El Nino effects start early, as could happen if we have a moderate or strong one, we could see wet and cool conditions start a little earlier than expected in the fall. And I've been in some conversations with David Zierden, who gave our talk about El Nino uh, last month, it might be that, you know, usually we expect dry conditions in the fall. And if it's wetter than usual, it means that harvesting is going to be more of an issue with the wet conditions begin. So producers might consider planting varieties that mature a little faster uh, if they haven't planted already. And then uh, once we get into the fall, you're going to really want to watch carefully to make sure you're taking advantage of any dry periods that there are. The graphs here on the bottom show what happens in El Nino fall. This is November through. January. Uh, on the left hand side is the anomaly or the what you expect to be the difference from uh, average conditions and you can see across most of the southeast uh, you expect conditions to be quite a bit wetter than usual in late fall. The likelihood just tells you um, how, how likely the forecast is to be and you can see some pretty high likelihoods there especially northern Florida, southern, southern Georgia um, and along the east coast of the Carolinas. And so um, keep that in mind if, if you're looking towards fall. I know it's been hard to get into the field, so you're planting things now. Um, don't put a lot of hope on being able to have a really late crop and don't leave uh, your produced um, peanuts or produced cotton in the field for a long time thinking that you've got all fall to harvest it. You're going to want to keep an eye on that. And so I think the next slide is my summary slide, so I will just leave that up there so you can look at that later. Um, a lot of things growing, a lot of things being planted right now, so it's really going to be an interesting time to see what happens over the coming season. It's my pleasure now to introduce our special guest speaker. His name is Adam Tarando. He's from the USGS Southeast Climate Adaptation and Science Center, and he's going to talk about trends and precipitation. I'm really excited to hear about this, so take it away, Adam. Okay, good morning everyone. It's great to be here. Um, and let's see, a couple caveats. Um, 
if we had an issue with GoToMeeting recording this, which I'm worried we will, because I haven't reset my GoToMeeting software yet on my Mac, um, I can get you these slides afterwards. So if anyone wants to see them, that's just a caveat up front. Um, but hopefully everything will work great. So thanks very much. Uh, my name is Adam Tarando. I'm a research scientist with the US Geological Survey, um, Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. And um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about um, precipitation in a uh, in a warming world today. So with that, um, let's get started. So um, yeah, so just uh, really briefly, I'm with um, this group of, of science centers in the USGS called the Climate Adaptation Science Centers. There's 10 of us around the country. Um, I'm in the Southeast um, uh, division of that. And so we are joint federal university research centers um, and our host institution is at NC State and part of a consortium of universities across the Southeast. And our mission is to deliver science to help fish, wildlife, water, land, and people adapt to a changing climate. Okay, so um, you know why why are we here? Why am I talking about climate change impacts on precipitation? This this um, doesn't come as a surprise, but just so we're all on the same page here, uh, human influence has has now warmed the climate at a rate that is unprecedented in at least the last two thousand years, um, and uh, it's possible that we're now in the warmest multi-century period um, in um, uh, upwards of a hundred thousand years now. Um, so um, these are the changes in climate. We know it's due to humans from increases in uh, greenhouse gases that we've put into the atmosphere. Some of those greenhouse gases stay up in the atmosphere for a very long time. Um, and that has an effect on the overall Earth's energy balance. And, to, and so then in reaction to that imbalance in energy, the planet warms. But there's other big consequences to this, not just a warming planet. Um, one really big consequence of um, a warmer planet is that in general, it rains harder. When it rains, it rains harder. And so a warmer atmosphere will have more water vapor in it. Okay, so this is the the, uh, the overall basic uh, physics that we're talking about here. Why do we expect this as the climate warms? And this is due to something called, um, which we characterize as the clausius clapeyron relation. So the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere increases at the temperatures that we experience on the surface of the earth and it's experiences at a rate of about seven percent per degree celsius of warming so you can see this is actually more like an exponential relationship rather than a linear relationship and of course it's a positive exponential relationship so as the temperature warms you get a very strong increase in the amount of water vapor um, overall that will be in the atmosphere and so we are actually, because the planet has been warming so much already, like I said, at a rate that we haven't seen in at least the last 2000 years, probably more than that, um, we are starting to observe these changes in heavy precipitation events um, around the globe. Again, um, we're, we mo mostly see this at the tail of the precipitation distribution, okay? And I'll get into that in a second. Um, and so this is from the IPCC and our governmental panel on climate change. Um, their most recent synthesis report or assessment report, which is the sixth one now. I'm getting through all my uh, acronyms down in the lower hand so you know what those mean. So that's the first working group which focuses on the physical science and this is the summary for policymakers. Okay, so showing this, you can they divided the world up into these regions and they then um, characterize, are they seeing increases, decreases, or um, a mix, or there's no data on trends in heavy precipitation. And so you can see there aren't really any regions um, where we can confidently say there's been any decreases in heavy precipitation events or amounts, but we do see many regions around the globe, including Eastern North America, that's what ENA means, and Central North America, uh, where we are um, seeing trends, increasing positive trends in heavy precipitation. So if we zoom into the United States, to the US, this is from the most recent National Climate Assessment um, from the Climate Science Special Report. We'll have a new National Climate Assessment uh, come out. The, the fifth National Climate Assessment will be coming out later this year, but this is from the one from 2017, 2018. And so in the Southeast, you can see the different regions. Um, we've seen increases in whatever metric you, however you slice and dice this, you pretty much get to show this increases in 
precipitation over the 20th and early 21st century, whether you're looking at the, the maximum daily precipitation or the, the very high end 99th percentile precipitation, or in say accumulated precipitation amounts over over different time scales, um, in this case, two year two day events, you see these increases in precipitation amounts um, over over the last century. Um, and so uh, the IPCC, they've also summarized this in a nice graphic that I like looking at, sort of thinking about this as, as sort of a loaded die um, or loaded dice. So if you're if how how much more likely are are these types of um, uh, uh, heavy precipitation events expected to be in the future um, now and in the future compared to the last time period before there was you know truly not really any uh, strong human influence on the climate um, and so if you compare to say 1815 to 1900 again that's that pre uh, human caused or anthropogenic climate change period. Um, an event that would occur um, on average once in every 10 years, so you know a 10% chance every year, now occurs about 1.3 times um, as as frequently as it did, um, because we've already had about one degree Celsius or um, about on close to two degrees Fahrenheit warming, um, and and that and those events themselves are about seven percent wetter than they were in the late 19th century. As the planet warms, depending on how much warming we experience in the future, we expect this to, to continue again because that warmer atmosphere will contain more water vapor. So to the point where if you have really extreme levels of warming in the future, those uh, precipitation events that on average that you had about a 10% chance every year, they will uh, um, on average occur about 2.7 times as frequently in the future and they will be approximately 30% wetter in the future. So those are big shifts over time. And again, they, they correspond pretty tightly to the amount of warming that we experience in the future. So we can see this for the US as well. Um, and this is projected changes um, in uh, uh, the 20 year extreme precipitation. So sort of the climatological extreme precipitation. So depending on how much greenhouse gas, this is a different way to look at it and, um, in terms of future greenhouse gas emissions rather than just future warming. So if we emit fewer greenhouse gases in the future, then we would expect this much increase in these extreme precipitation events. And if we emit more greenhouse gas emissions, then we see about a doubling. This is for just two different scenarios of greenhouse gases in the future. Now, interestingly, um, we have much more uncertainty about how average precipitation will shake out. Um, so in the Southeast here, I have North Carolina highlighted, but across the entire Southeast, you see that there's, um, uh, most areas are right now projected to have slight increases in annual precipitation, although in the Western portion of the Southeast, um, the projections are for a slight decrease or more moderate decrease in precipitation over time. So that means there's uncertainty in terms of the sign and the magnitude of total precipitation, even though we have a much higher confidence in um, extreme precipitation getting more extreme um, in the future. So we can see this um, when we look at um, sort of aggregate all the climate models we have um, and and look at the projected future changes. This is for a really high emission scenario, high warming uh, scenario for the end of the century. But it's useful to look at this so we can kind of see like when you really whack the system, what's what's the response? And so what I just want to show here is that hot extreme. So on the top is is projected mean temperature change in the top left. On the lower left is the projected change in the um, like the, the annual maximum daily temperature. And just what I want you to, sh to point out here is that the patterns look pretty much the same if you look from the top left to the lower left, okay? So that means that extremes, hot extreme temperatures scale pretty much linearly with the average temperature. Not really the same with precipitation, okay? It is in some regions, but across the globe, it's not. So in the top right here, we show the projected precipitation change, annual precipitation change across the whole globe for the end of the century, again, for a really high end warming scenario. And you can see that there's um, 
pretty significant increases in precipitation in the tropics and across the Sahara, um, pretty significant precipitation declines across the, um, the, the subtropical Atlantic and most of the subtropical oceanic regions across the, the planet, and then the mix in between. But when you look at the change in extremes, projected extremes, um, you see that it's pretty much increases everywhere across the globe. So extremes do not necessarily scale in the same way as we get more warming as, as say, the annual precipitation scales, okay? So just to beat this idea over the head for you, um, you know, a, a wetter global, we expect a wetter global atmosphere, but annual precipitation changes um, are, like, are likely less than the percent changes in moisture. So that's what I'm showing here. So the percentage change in moisture that we project, here we're showing for over tropical areas up the top or over um, extra tropical terrestrial areas over the bottom in the summer and the winter, the moisture scales pretty, pretty strongly as temperature changes. That's this dashed line. We also expect precipitation to increase or sorry, precipitation variability to increase pretty strongly in most areas of the globe and for most seasons, okay? Not as much as the moisture itself in the atmosphere changes, but the variability, again, and that takes into account those more frequent um, extreme precipitation events and more intense extreme precipitation events, it scales more rapidly and more strongly than the overall mean precipitation events, which is the long dashed line here, okay? That's kind of summarizing the differences between moisture in the atmosphere, variability of precipitation, again, changing those extremes, and then overall mean precipitation. So if I can summarize all of that, just in, in sort of one slide, um, this again is from the, the last national climate assessment. We expect fewer showers, but more deluges, more really extreme precipitation events. That that event in Fort Lauderdale that, that we talked about in the beginning of the session, that's sort of the type of thing that, that we think about more um, occurring more frequently. So that's those that idea of a one in a thousand year event, um, probably a bit of a misnomer, which is why we, we um, because those those out of sample events are are becoming more in sample um, as we as the planet warms. So this is sort of bearing out in statistics for the southeast. So this is a figure showing the total precipitation in the southeast is is moderately increasing. Okay, so this is a time series from the the mid 50s up until 2021. And I didn't even bother plotting a trend line here because there just really isn't much of a trend line. Um, you know, if you squint, maybe you see a, a, a very slight increase towards the end of the, of the time period. Um, but the bulk of that precipitation is falling on fewer days. So this is the same time series, but this is the percent of rainy days um, needed to reach the 50, to reach half of the annual precipitation. Okay, and so you can see that you own in the beginning of the period. First of all, these are very pretty low numbers, maybe pretty surprising to you that um, in the 50s it took about 15 and a half, 16 days to reach um, half of the total precipitation of the year um, when you average across the whole region. That's dropped now by a full day, so now it only takes about 14 and a half days, about um, the, 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 the 14 wettest days of the year typically add up to about half the total annual precipitation in the southeast. So you can see how much of the total annual distribution of precipitation is really skewed towards those extreme heavy events, okay? And so this, this is consistent with what we expect globally, okay? So this is plotted across long-term precipitation stations in the upper left-hand panel here across the globe. And you see again that these numbers, really all I want you to see here is what the scale of these numbers are. So how many days does it take to get to your half halfway point of total annual precipitation? And across most of these temperate areas of the globe, it's in this sort of 14 to you know 25, 30, 25 or so days of precipitation. Some of the more arid regions where of course precipitation variability is very important. It's it's really you get most you get half of your precipitation in just a couple of days. And again, this is what we expect this trend to continue as the planet warms, and it depends on how much warming we get in the future. 
So there's a greater percentage of precipitation comes from intense events getting more intense over time. So if this is what we ex what what the statistics bear out right now, so this is the percentile range. This is showing the really high um, um, intensity precipitation events and the frequency of occurrence of those events. So this is just the arithmetic of relating the X and Y axis in the black line here. What we expect, and this is showing the aggregation of the recent two most recent generation of climate model results, that could CMIP 5 and CMIP 6 means, we expect the really high intense precipitation events to become relatively much more frequent in the future. And of course, that's gonna account for a lot, a, a, very, a pretty significant proportion of the total annual precipitation change. Now, we expect then, again, fewer smaller precipitation events, okay? And again, and that's due to this, um, the fact that as you have that more moist atmosphere, as it gets warmer, you can really rain out in more extreme events. And it also draws in moisture from other regions, which can, um, where other regions had more moderate amount of moisture in the atmosphere at the same time, then they don't have enough to precipitate out. So that's sort of the mechanism to, to get fewer showers and more deluges. And you can see how this bears out then and across the annual precipitation and our uncertainty in the sign and magnitude of total precipitation change compared to changes in extremes. So this is just, I just pulled out some, uh, uh, this is from our postdoc in the Southeast Cast from Kasia and Nico. Um, the projected annual precipitation change across some higher resolution statistically downscale climate models by the middle, mid, middle of this century and you can really just kind of pay attention to the color scheme here where um, there's uncertainty uh, in the annual precipitation in terms of across the climate models, are we gonna get annual an annual precipitation that's higher or lower than what we have now, okay? And so there's just uncertainty about that sign, again, because uh, we don't know that the overall annual precipitation change may not shift that much given that tug of war between circulation changes and a moisture atmosphere drawing in more moisture um, through convergence processes to get more intense precipitation that draws out moisture from other regions. And you can see that becomes a bit more pronounced when you just look at the bottom two panels here, which are showing the same projections, but instead of annual precipitation change, the bottom two panels are for summer precipitation change, so June, July, and August. You can see that uncertainty increases more, so you could even have drier, um, we, we're not really sure if, if we would have drier summers or wetter summers, um, but we are um, much more confident that when it does rain, those there's a much higher chance that those um, events will be more extreme and will have more rainfall in them. So, okay, wrapping up here, what about just really quickly, what do we expect with hurricanes, um, with tropical, since they're an important contributor to overall precipitation in the Southeast? Um, we still um, are not really, there's still pretty high uncertainty about the frequency overall of, of hurricanes, but we do expect sort of similar to, um, you know, when it rains, it pours harder. We do expect that when cyclones, tropical cyclones do form that there's a higher chance, higher probability that, that they will be stronger hurricanes in the future. And of course that has um, really significant if, um, um, implications for the precipitation associated with those stronger cyclones. Um, and we're already starting with that sort of warmer, juicier atmosphere. So we're all, are likely already starting to see human influence on the precipitation events associated with, with tropical cyclones. There was a study that came out a few years ago that was able to um, show there's a, um, a significant likelihood that that the precipitation amounts in, in Harvey were influenced by the increased greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and the warmer atmosphere that this storm sort of had to work with um, in terms of then precipitation. So humans are probably likely um, responsible for increasing the precipitation amounts in Harvey by approximately 40% over if humans had not influenced the climate to the degree that we have already. And there's also this interesting trend, which we're still um, sort of studying that tropical cyclone forward speeds have, have decreased, um, particularly in the North Atlantic. So that's another wrinkle to this, that um, if it's, um, that if that trend continues, then that would have 
serious implications for then the amount of rainfall that could fall during these tropical cyclone events. Okay, finally, what about droughts? Um, well, again, overall, we expect the, the earth to have a, a, a wetter atmosphere, but that moisture sloshes around and moves around in a really dynamic way. Um, and you have, and then combined with um, uh, hotter temperatures, um, some regions we do expect we'll, we'll see more drying and we'll get more, we'll have um, increased aridity in the future. So for areas that will dry as the climate warms, which are these, which right now is what we project in these sort of boxes here and the, and the, the, the picture of the earth here, um, the frequency and intensity of drought are, drought are both expected to increase. We do see right now that that doesn't really cover the Southeast US except on the Western portion of the Southeast US. While there's still pretty strong consensus of um, across climate models of drying in the Western, far Western portion of the Southeast and to Louisiana, Arkansas, and Texas. So the climate change effects on drought are complex though. Um, and they kind of boil down to um, what happens um, with atmospheric evaporative demand um, which is expected to increase as the planet warms, but how that then um, relates to drought is dependent on if you're already in an arid environment or are you in a humid environment. So when you have the sort of building blocks of atmospheric evaporative demand related to radiation, wind speed, humidity, and temperature, um, um, those effects then in terms of drought are really um, get more complex, where if you're in arid conditions, you kind of expect a positive feedback where um, drought would increase atmospheric evaporative demand leads to more drought. But in humid areas, it, it kind of depends on what's going on beforehand. If you're already in sort of a moist regime or a moist pattern, um, that increased atmospheric evaporative demand could actually result in just more humidity in the atmosphere and increased uh, rainfall. But if you're in a dry period, increased evaporative demand could make that drought worse. So it really is just kind of depends on what, what moisture regime are you in at the time um, in terms of the overall effect on drought. So that's all I had. I wanted to wrap up, make sure there's time for questions. Um, Thanks, thanks again. I will, um, I forgot to do my five takeaways, so I'll make sure that you have that and going out for the when uh, Meredith sends out the, the summary email. Um, so appreciate your time and um, happy to take any questions. Great, Adam, that was fantastic. And I am always so impressed with the IPCC graphics. So thank you, Adam, for taking time to join us. And of course, thank you so much to our regular speakers, uh, Pam and Chris and Jeff. My name is Meredith Muth. I work at the National Integrated Drought Information System, NIDIS. We co-organize this webinar series for the past three years with the National Weather Service and the Southeast Regional Climate Center. If you have any questions today for any of our speakers or any questions about climate in the Southeast in general, please go ahead and enter that into your question box. As Chris mentioned earlier, we do provide a summary in a webinar recap form, as well as a recording that will be sent out to all registered participants. Um, we have two upcoming webinars scheduled. The next one we'll look at, as we move into the heat season, a web-based tool to assess your heat risk. And then in June, we're gonna have our official uh, National Weather Service 2023 Hurricane Outlook. If there are, are any other suggestions that you have for our webinar series, including potential topics to talk about with guest speakers, we would love to hear from you. So take a couple of minutes with that post-webinar survey. And so before I open this up for questions, I'd like to see if any of our speakers on today has any additional insight you would like to provide related to ENSO or anything else, and then I'll open it for questions. Okay, and with that, I'll go ahead and start our Q&A period. Um, our first question, I'm going to direct this one to Adam, but I think anyone can answer this. Does anyone, has anyone done an analysis of the percent of warming due to humans versus natural or other causes? Um, yeah, of course, that depends on the, the time scale we're talking about, but um, overall we can identify that. So we've had about 
um, since the late 19th century, the planet has warmed about 1.1 degrees Celsius. So that's almost two degrees Fahrenheit. Humans have actually um, are actually responsible for, <laughs> it's a little tricky, more than 100% of that. Um, we put in enough um, greenhouse gas in the atmosphere to cause about maybe 1.2 degrees Celsius warming, but we've also put in a lot of aerosols um, into the atmosphere, so um, things from industrial processes, and those for the most part act to cool the climate. So you get this kind of um, a little bit of a, a, a negative cooling effect from the aerosols combined with the warming effect. So if we hadn't had those aerosols in the atmosphere, um, the warming would be even stronger. So technically, it's it's humans are responsible for more than 100% of of the warming if you count for the all the greenhouse gases. But the net effect of of um, warming and cooling is about 1.1 degrees. So you can basically just boil it down to humans are responsible for all the warming that we've experienced since the late 19th century. And I'll follow up with that. There's a question asking if without human influence, would the earth be cooling right now? Um, without human influence, it would mm, maybe ever so slightly, um, but it's it's sort of really not so much so again since the late 19th century if you just account for say like you know changes in in the amount of solar energy we've gotten they're they're very small like like a 0.1 degrees celsius um you know plus or minus so it, it kind of hovers around the zero line but maybe um we might actually have seen like a very small amount of warming since the late 19th century more like again just an order of magnitude um less than the amount of uh, warming we have seen. So um, yeah, if, if there had been cooling since the late 19th century when humans really started influencing the planet, um, it'd be a pretty small amount. Great, thanks, Adam. Hey, we have a couple of questions about some of your slides. Could I make you presenter again? And could you put up your slide deck if that's convenient? Sure. Okay, I'll do that right now. There was so much information that was covered is excellent. Um, the, the first question is going to be related to a graph of frequency of occurrence versus percentile change. Okay. We can show that. Frequency. And the question, oh, I'll wait. Let's see if I can find the right one. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure which one there. Oh, go ahead and with the question. But um, the question was, um, uh, if you could explain the vertical scale, the result you pointed to was 20% or was it 0.2%? Okay. Well, I I'm not exactly sure which one they're referring to, but um, I it would be 20%. Um, that's that's the order of magnitude of, of types of changes we're looking at. So I'm sorry, I'm not sure exactly which one they're thinking of. Maybe it's this one, but it would it would be 20%. Actually, if you could stay on that one, that's perfect. We had another question on that exact slide. Is this slide um, from the southeast or is this global? This is global. Yeah. Great. But um, for the southeast, you can you can sort of look at it do the do the math um for this one for instance um and so we don't i don't have the exact same like sort of 0.1 probability event slide for the southeast but um you know you could look at say the 99th percentile precipitation um and it, you can see that the 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 changes are are pretty significant there this is just in the last 60 years but you can see the large increases in in those um the percentage change in those events is about 27%. Great, and I'll just let you leave that up there in case there's anything else that you'd like to go to. We have a couple more questions for you, Adam. Sure. Uh, it's uh, someone who saw a paper talking about how land surface change is the dominant factor for an increase in the future. 
And therefore, are we expecting more runoff overall in the U.S.? Do you have any comments on that? Okay. Let's see. Projected increase in global runoff dominated by land surface changes. Uh, I don't, I, you know what, that sounds like a great question for Jacob LaFontaine. Um, is he a future speaker, I think, maybe? He, he is. He'll actually be talking to us in a couple of months. So that was excellent. So yeah. two few months and we'll have, we'll be able to talk a little bit more about the the land interactions absolutely yeah and i mean it doesn't surprise me because again you're talking about runoff there and you know humans have an enormous influence on the land surface so um i i haven't read that article um i would I actually that that looks interesting i think i'll put that on my reading list um I'll just say that that doesn't necessarily surprise me for the for the for the future in terms of specifically for runoff. Okay. So I think we have time for two more questions. The first one is uh, related to precipitation extremes, and you had an exponential curve. Mm -hmm. So um, is the exponential curve for precipitation extremes? It shows that there shows us that there is a tipping point. Does this line go straight up at some point, a point of disaster and breakdown, in other words? Yeah, but luckily we have enough very strong negative feedbacks in the system that um, we, it's, it's um, highly unlikely, <laughs> I would say virtually certain um, that we would not get there, at least not until, um, probably until the sun becomes a red giant, you know, a billion years from now and engulfs us all. So <laughs> we don't really have to worry about that particular tipping point um, where uh, what you would be seeing there, what would that would basically, um, you're, you're talking there about basically all the, the water in the oceans um, uh, evaporating because we've reached temperatures of about 60 degrees Celsius, you know, so that's, that's like in the hundred average global temperatures of like 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then you do start to actually reach sort of a runaway greenhouse um, effect where you turn into Venus and all, everything, you get sort of a steam planet. So luckily we don't really have to worry about that, I don't think. Um, but yeah, good, good, catching that. That is the implication of, of um, the physics of this. Oh, that's great. Um, we're going to do uh, two more quick questions, one related for Pam on agriculture and then one related to Florida, and then we'll wrap this up. Um, Pam, here's a question. Can we expect to have shifts in areas of agricultural production or at least in kinds of the agricultural production within the regions? Absolutely. What yeah, absolutely. Um, we're already seeing it. It's not in the future. Um, we're seeing shifts to different varieties that can take advantage of warmer temperatures. We're seeing new vari or new crops coming in. And in Georgia here, we now have olives and we have uh, satsumas and some others as well, pomegranates. Um, and so farmers are taking advantage of that. If we look at it in the U.S. as a whole, there's a large area in the northern um, states where they're now growing corn, where they could never grow corn before. They could only grow wheat because it was too dry. But now that they have more moisture, they're able to grow corn, and corn usually pays a little better than wheat does. And so there's certainly some incentive to do that. So absolutely, we're seeing the shifts all the time. Farmers are smart. You know, they're going to take advantage of that. Um, and there's also more double cropping. People will put in an early crop, um, and then after they harvest that, they'll put in a second crop, which is good for farmers because it's two sources of income instead of one, even though obviously there's costs involved with each of those. So yeah, that's, things are happening now, and I expect that to accelerate in the future. Oh, that's great, thank you. Um, last question is uh, just related to the Florida, um, uh, the Fort Lauderdale April extreme precipitation event. Chris, has there been any climate change attribution and detection study conducted to date or expected for that? Uh, I'm not aware of one currently going on, but I suspect that there will be. Um, and, uh, and and also, I, I'm pretty sure that, the, that a state climate extremes committee uh, will be formed. Uh, that'll involve the National Weather Service, NCEI, us at the Regional Climate Center, as well as Dave Zierden, 
um, and the regional uh, weather service uh, uh, headquarters uh, to investigate the viability of that record. It'll be an interesting one to investigate because I'm not aware, and David may know, but I'm not aware of a uh, of a weather stem rain gauge uh, being evaluated as a potential state record. We obviously have had you know co-op stations, automated rain gauges, as well as Coco Ross be uh, evaluated for state records, but this may be the first weather stem uh, evaluated. So I suspect um, that process will begin shortly. Uh, Dave may know more about that, but um, that's um, that's all I've got there. Great, thank you. Um, we're, we're a little past the hour. We didn't get to all your questions, but I just wanna say thank you so much for joining us this month. Um, we look forward to seeing you next month. And again, a huge thank you to our speakers. Um, and have a wonderful day.